Hi everyone. A very very good evening to all of you and welcome to the session on INI predictor series, right? All right. So hoping that the audio video is good for all and just to give you a small input, we are going to have 20 questions for this session. So everyone ready? Yes. So we'll have 20 questions and I want you to do what I always ask you to do whenever we have quiz rounds or whenever we have uh, MCQ sessions. I want you to sit with a sheet of paper and mark how many do you do correct out of these 20. Yes, so we are going to keep the discussion concise and crisp and we are trying to bring the most important topics for the day, right? And uh, I hope everyone is ready. No, you don't need to write anything. Okay, you have everything in your notes. You just need to write your score. I want you to tell me your score at the end of the session, right? So you're going to give yourself marks out of 20 and then you will let me know. So are you all ready? Should we begin? Okay, perfect. So happy to have all of you. I'll try and make it as high yielding as possible. So let's go ahead. And this is going to be your first question for the day. I'm going to give you two seconds to sit and analyze and mark what is the answer. I'm going to read out the question for you. Yes. So in which of the following conditions would the woman present with primary amenorrhea? And the other keyword is she should also have an XY karyotype. Right. So I want everyone to commit their answer. I'm going to give two seconds and then I'm going to start the discussion of the question. Right. So in which of the following conditions would the woman present with primary amenorrhea and XY karyotype? Are we all ready? Perfect. Have you all committed your answers? OK, so once you commit your answers, I am going to start the discussion. It is a multiple completion type and these are the kind of questions that are coming more and more in INICT exams. So you should know the answers. Let's do it now. So Swire syndrome. So Swire syndrome is a type of what? It is a type of complete gonadal dysgenesis, right? Please be aware of the term. It is a type of complete gonadal dysgenesis and this is also called as pure gonadal dysgenesis, right? So it is also called as pure gonadal dysgenesis and you're absolutely right. Here the karyotype is going to be 46XY, right? So this will be included, but the phenotype is female. Right, so the phenotype here is going to be female. I'm going to discuss some additional extra points about some of these, but first let's see what would be the answer. So definitely A will be included. What about Riefenstein syndrome? So will that be included? Yes, because if we talk about Riefenstein syndrome, what is this? This is another name for partial AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And if it is partial AIS, androgen insensitivity again has XY karyotype. So this will also be included. Let's look at the third one. 5 alpha reductase deficiency. So in 5 alpha reductase, again, it is going to be XY. And please remember in Riefenstein and 5 alpha reductase deficiency, uterus is going to be absent. Yes, so in both of them, the uterus is absent. What about Swire syndrome? In Swire syndrome, the uterus is present, right? So the uterus is present here. Okay, what about Turner's? So I'm sure everyone knows about Turner's. That is something that you're very confident about. So remember, Turner's is 45XO. So what is the answer? We will include 1, 2 and 3. That makes the answer as B. So how many of you have marked it correct? Put a tick mark on, uh, you know, question number 1 that you've got it correct. And it's a good start. I can see each one of you have done pretty well. So now I'm just going to give you some very, very important key points about these as well. So please remember, Swires is complete or pure gonadal dysgenesis. But please remember for INICT that when you say complete or pure gonadal dysgenesis, do you understand that this can also be XX? Yes. So they can be XY, they can be 46XX. The XY one is what is called as Swire syndrome. So, right, so that is the one that is called as Swire syndrome. And please remember, it is the XY type 
only that will need gonadectomy. These things have been previously asked in the INICT exam, so you should know about this. So, not all of them would need gonadectomy, only the ones which have the Y chromosome would need gonadectomy. Yes, is that understandable? Okay. Also, remember when we talk about Swire's syndrome, around 10 to 15 percent cases of Swire's syndrome are because of deletion in the SRY gene and another 10 to 15 percent are because of mutations in the SRY gene. Okay, so they are because of mutations. So, a total of approximately 20 to 30 percent involve the SRY gene. In remaining, the SRY gene may be normal as well. Okay, so this is again important. Also, please remember when we talk about, you know, um, gonadectomy, it is only and only done when there is a female phenotype with a Y chromosome. So, would you do a gonadectomy in Turner syndrome? No, right? So, gonadectomy would not be done in Turner syndrome. What about AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome? Would you do a gonadectomy? Yes, right? So, here gonadectomy is done. So, gonadectomy is done when there is a female phenotype with a Y chromosome. So, these are all important previous year questions in INICT. You should know about them, okay? How do you differentiate? Okay, two points about partial AIS. You should know the name that it is called as Riefenstein syndrome. But how do you differentiate Riefenstein from complete AIS? So, please remember, if it is complete AIS, they have a hypoplastic clitoris. Whereas, if it is Riefenstein syndrome, which is partial AIS, they have clitoromegaly. Okay, they have clitoromegaly. Remember, clitoromegaly can also be seen in 5-alpha reductase deficiency at puberty. So, how will you then differentiate 5-alpha reductase from partial AIS? So, remember, if it is 5-alpha reductase deficiency, there is no breast development, okay? They may have clitoromegaly, but they will not have breast development. What about partial AIS and complete AIS? They will have breast development. So, these are key things which will help you differentiate these close, close DDs of each other, right? Okay, so I am sure a lot of you have done it right and I am happy. Are you ready for the next question? Are you ready for question number two, everybody? Okay. So, the next question on your screen is yet another specific pattern to INICT which is in the form of match the following. So, the question is match the conditions with their correct hormonal profiles. I am going to give you two seconds to match them, write your answer in your notebook and then we will see whether you do it right or wrong. Okay, so you have to match the hormonal profile with the given conditions okay so two seconds and then we begin the discussion all right so are we ready for the discussion has everyone committed their answers i want each one of you to commit your answer in your answer sheet and then you will share your final score with me right and we are going to learn some important points especially things which you know inict is fond of asking everyone commit your answers and we begin the discussion now okay so, when we talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome, what about the classic hormonal finding here? So, polycystic ovarian syndrome will be associated by high LH levels, right? The LH levels are going to be high. They're consistently high. The FSH is usually in the normal range. It may be slightly less, but usually in the normal range. And the E2 levels are also going to be normal. Right. So, for one, the correct combination is C. So, high LH, normal FSH and normal E2 is for PCOS. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Asherman syndrome. So, intrauterine adhesions or synechiae. Remember, everything apart from the uterus here or the outflow tract is normal. So, there will be normal LH, normal FSH as well as normal estradiol, right? So, what is the correct combination? A. So, for Asherman syndrome, it is going to be A, okay? Then, let's look at Kalman's. 
Kalman syndrome is a condition where GnRH is absent. So, there is no stimulus to the pituitary. So, what would be the findings? Everything will be low, right? So, there will be low LH, low FSH and low estradiol levels. Everything is going to be low. What about Turner's syndrome? So, in Turner's syndrome, the LH and FSH are high, right? Because of no feedback inhibition. So, there is high LH and high FSH, but the estradiol levels are low because there are streak ovaries, right? So, what is the correct combination? I think 1C, 2A, 3D and 4B. That makes the answer as C, right? So, that makes the answer as C. So, all of you who have got it correct, give yourself a tick mark. You have done the second question correct and we are going to talk about some important points about each of these because they are again important for your INICT exams. So, please remember as far as Turner syndrome is concerned, it is also called as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Okay. You should all remember the clinical features that you can see in a woman with Turner syndrome. But apart from that, know that they can have a lot of autoimmune problems. Right. Typically, you should know they have problems with the thyroid function. So, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, diabetes mellitus. So, we have to monitor these things for these women. We also need to do an audiometry. We also need to do cardiovascular evaluation, right? Monitor the blood pressure of the patient. Even ophthalmic examination is important in these patients, right? So, you need to monitor them for these disorders as well, okay? So, that is important. As I said earlier, remember they don't need gonadectomy. The other important thing that I want you to know about Turner's, especially with respect to INICT, remember no doubt the treatment of choice for them is going to be HRT, right? Hormone replacement therapy. And it has to be both E plus P, E plus P. But INI kya karta hai? They go into more depth. So, in case they go into more depth, you have to know that initially it will be E alone, okay? Initially it is going to be E alone for a span of one to two years because you want to mimic natural puberty and then you will add progesterone. So eventually you have to add both E and P. But agar wo depth mein puchenge, to you have to know that the initial treatment will be with E alone, okay? And then you are going to add progesterone therapy. Quickly, can you tell me what are you going to do for infertility in these women in case we ask you? Right? So, can you tell me what are we going to uh, ask you with respect to uh, infertility management in these patients? So, remember they would need a donor ovum, not a surrogate mother, right? So, those things have again been asked previously in the exam. So, donor ovum but not a surrogate mother, alright? Hypergonadotropic, Shravan, because when the gonad is not there, there is no feedback inhibition. So, as a result of which the LH and FSH levels are high. So, that is why you call it as hypergonadotropic. But the ovaries are non-functioning, so hypogonadism, alright? What about Kalman syndrome? What is the other name for Kalman's? The other name for Kalman's is hypogonadotropic. So, Turner's was hyper. This is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, right? Because all the hormone levels are low, okay? So, please remember the reason of Kalman syndrome is absent GnRH, yes? So, absent GnRH. Quickly tell me what is the other characteristic finding with Kalman's and they are again very important PYQs. So, I am sure each one of you knows that this is going to be anosmia. So, one characteristic feature which will always be the best answer is anosmia, right? This is because of involvement of the olfactory nerve, right? Okay, Ashermans. When we talk about Asherman syndrome, can you tell me, apart from the hormonal profile, the important thing is what could be the clinical presentation in Asherman's? Clinical presentation. So, the most important is menstrual irregularities. It is a group, right? So, they will have menstrual irregularities. What else? In the menstrual irregularities, I want you to know that amenorrhea is the best answer followed by hypomenorrhea, right? So, amenorrhea 
followed by hypomenorrhea but what could be the other problems apart from menstrual irregularity so please remember they can have infertility which is the second most common in the group if you put as most common group followed by the next then they can also present with recurrent pregnancy losses and remember that they can also have what apart from this yes they can have dysmenorrhea because there is obstruction to the outflow and dysmenorrhea can definitely be written as cyclical pain right so dysmenorrhea can definitely be written as cyclical pain because INICT has been asking these questions again in multiple completion format clinical presentations for Ashermans okay PCOS hormonal profile for PCOS is important so apart from the things that we have written please remember that E2 to E1 ratio is reversed so in the previous question or in this question we've told you E2 is usually normal but what happens to E1 the E1 is going to increase right also remember sex hormone binding globulin levels are low in PCOS okay and as far as androgens are concerned you have to know that they are mildly raised okay so androgens are only mildly raised so there will be no features of virilization in PCOS okay there will never be features of virilization what you see is hirsutism quickly let me see who can tell me the name of classification system for hirsutism what is the name of the classification system right so we call it as the ferryman galway score okay so ferryman galway score is what we use to look for hirsutism and a general thing is if the score is more than or equal to 8 we say there is hirsutism right so remember the terminology ferryman galway right everyone ready for the third question yes are you ready for the third question and you're going to commit your answers okay so this is the next question you have to answer true and false and convert it into the options so i'm going to give you two minutes the first question is study for criteria you have to see whether it is correctly matched or not so commit your answers and then i will start the discussion i'm going to give you two seconds to commit your answer on the answer sheet and then i'm going to discuss right okay so let's look at this so study for criteria are they for abdominal ectopic yes that's a true statement study for criteria are for abdominal ectopic what are the criteria for ovarian ectopic for ovarian ectopic, they are Spiegelberg criteria, right? So, for ovarian ectopic, they are Spiegelberg criteria, okay? What about Sydney criteria? Are they for HELP syndrome? That's false. Has been a PYQ as well. So, please remember, Sydney criteria is not for HELP. What is Sydney criteria for? Sydney or modified Sapporo, right? This is the criteria for APLA, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, right? What are the named criteria for HELP syndrome? The named criteria for HELP syndrome is Tennessee criteria, right? So, the named criteria are Tennessee criteria and I am sure that you will be able to diagnose HELP. Please remember, you just have to look for evidence of hemolysis. You have to look for low platelet count and you have to look for elevated liver enzymes. Yes, please remember the criteria for low platelet count is less than 1 lakh, right? So, less than 1 lakh. Now, please also understand AIMS or INICT would want maybe ask you how will you decide whether it is help or it is acute fatty liver. So, remember, if you see signs of liver failure, for example, high ammonia, low glucose, DIC, right, encephalopathy, then the answer should change to acute fatty liver. So, if you see uh, liver failure signs, please do not mark it as help. You have to answer this as acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Okay, perfect. Let's move on to the third option. Modified biophysical profile, does it include amniotic fluid and NST? Yes, this is a true statement. It includes 
amniotic fluid and nst and please remember here when you are going to look for amniotic fluid we have to count the total amount of amniotic fluid so which we can do with amniotic fluid index or with single deep pocket or deep vertical pocket any criteria can be used but we have to see the total amount of amniotic fluid okay perfect let's move on to the last one is it true quadruple test between 22 to 24 weeks this is a false statement when do you do quadruple test bache so remember quad test has to be done anywhere between 15 to 22 weeks okay so quad test between 15 to 22 weeks this is also the time that you can do the triple test so triple test and quad test ka time same hota hai who is going to tell me quickly the other name for triple test okay remember bart b a r t is nothing but another name for triple test who is going to tell me which component of quad is not included in triple test so if we look at quad it has alpha fetoprotein ue3 hcg and inhibin a remember it's inhibin a not inhibin b right so quad mein ye charo aate hain which is not included not included yes so in triple test inhibin a is not included okay it is not included yes so please remember although the time span is from 15 to 22 weeks but most commonly most commonly when is quad done so most commonly it is done between 16 to 18 weeks so answer to this question is d and if you have done it correct please tick mark in your answer sheet that you have marked it correct yes did you do it right all of you okay perfect i am seeing that most of you are doing all of them are you know correct answers so well prepared let's move on to the next question for the day okay a topic that INICT is fond of asking all our physiological changes of pregnancy except okay what is your answer quickly comment in the answer box as well as in your sheets and then we will mark so let me see if you got confused with this one all the following are physiological changes except the answer is is which one the answer is C increased residual volume so please remember reserve and residual volume okay they decrease right why are you answering it is d total t3 and t4 definitely they increase which one shows no change yes it is free t3 and t4 that shows no change and TSH also shows no change. It remains normal, right? So, please remember total T3, T4 do increase. The free forms show no change. Also, when it comes to respiratory changes, please remember PCO2 decreases and PO2 increases, right? What all shows? Okay, things that INICT has asked before. Remember, minute ventilation increases okay minute ventilation increases tidal volume increases okay these have been pviqs in inict exam remember vital capacity shows no change okay so vital capacity shows no change i thought you will get confused with option b did anybody get confused with option b so please remember this Total protein excretion increases. This is a true statement. Okay, because of increase in renal blood flow and because of increase in GFR, the total protein excretion increases, but it remains below the significant level. So, what is the significant level for protein urea? So, you all know significant protein urea is more than or equal to 0 0.3 grams in a 24-hour urine sample, right? Or we say more than or equal to plus 2 in dipstick or we say urine protein creatinine ratio, okay? Urine protein creatinine ratio which is more than or equal to 0 0.3. So, there is increase in the protein excretion but 
it does not cross the significant level in normal pregnancy. If it crosses, then we include it as a criteria for preeclampsia, right? Okay. What about ESR? So, yes, definitely ESR increases. Who is going to tell me the reason behind increase in ESR? What is the reason? Has been a PYQ in INICT. So, remember the reason here is increase in fibrinogen levels. Okay, increase in the fibrinogen levels. Yes, Sunanda, you are absolutely right, Bache. Respiratory rate shows no change. Okay, so please remember that respiratory rate also shows no change. Okay, okay perfect. Are you ready for the next question? And are you ready to commit your answers? All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, what type of pregnancy is shown in the image below? So, what is the type of pregnancy that you can think this is? Quickly commit your answers and then we start the discussion. So, what type of pregnancy is shown below? So, now once you've seen and I've given you a few seconds to answer, what you need to know is Whenever you see a dividing membrane, it has to be diamniotic. So, you are seeing a dividing membrane and it has to be diamniotic. So, options with monoamniotic are going to be incorrect. Okay, they are going to be incorrect. Then, actually out of the other two, MCDA to exist in nahi kar sakta. Uh, okay, nahi kar sakta hai, but in this question, typically, if we talk about it, please see the dividing membrane. It is showing you the lambda sign, right? So, it is showing you the lambda sign and not just that, it is a thick dividing membrane. Yes, can you all appreciate? It is a thick dividing membrane with a lambda sign. So, this is going to be dichorionic and diamniotic. Absolutely right, Swat, uh, Swagata Lakshmi. Lambda sign is also called as twin peak sign. Okay, and please remember the best time to look for it is between 10 to 14 weeks. This is the best time to look for chorionicity as well. Okay, so best time to look for chorionicity is between 10 to 14 weeks. If you have to mark single best, it is going to be 10 weeks, but it's usually a range of 10 to 14. What is the sign that you see with monochorionic twins? Yes, so please remember with monochorionic, it is going to be T sign, which is also called as the inverted T sign, right? So it is also going to be called as the inverted T sign. Okay. Also, when we talk about the types of twins, INICT is fond of asking. So, I want to know from you, in general, what is the most common type of monozygotic twin? Can you tell me? Most common type of monozygotic twin. The key word here is monozygotic. So, this has to be monochorionic and diamniotic, right? So, monochorionic, diamniotic, recall and tell me. On what days cell division will lead to MCDA twins? So, yes. So, if the cell division happens between the 4th and 8th day post-fertilization. How do INICT specially ask this question? Instead of asking you days, they will ask you in what stage does the cell division happen? So, this is going to be blastocyst stage. So, if the cell division happens in the blastocyst stage or between the 4th to the 8th day, it is going to be monochorionic and diamniotic. First 3 days, it is going to be dichorionic, diamniotic or we say in the morula stage. And a PYQ which INICT has already asked, if cell division happens after the formation of embryonic disc, after the formation of embryonic disc, then what is the kind of twins? Then this is going to be conjoint twins, which is also called as simies. What about monochorionic and monoamniotic? When would they form? If the cell division happens between 8th to 12th day or we say at the time of implantation. So, from 8th to 12th day or at the time of implantation, these are the kind of twists that the INICT usually puts in these questions. So, remember different formats of asking the same thing. That's what they do. They want to check the depth in these particular topics. 
Okay, perfect. So good going everyone. Let's move on to the next question. So let me see if you can come at an answer for this one now. The following picture of pap smear is obtained from a 45 year old woman with a left ovarian mass. What is the likely diagnosis? Who is going to quickly commit their answers because I am waiting for your answers and you have to write it in your answer sheet as well as in the chat box also. So tell me what is the likely answer and what do you see in the pap smear? Can you see? So yes. So the pap smear here is showing you plenty of pink cells. Yes. So it is showing us plenty of pink cells and what do pink cells mean? This means the predominant hormone here is estrogen, right? So the predominant hormone here is estrogen. And what we are trying to ask you is which ovarian tumor is going to produce estrogen? And as I can see, you're all answering it correct. That is perfect. It is going to be granulosa cell tumor. And what do the pink cells mean? Yes, that's a good going everyone. So Shabnam and Lakshmi, everybody. Yes, Sushmita. So pink cells actually mean superficial cells and if you can see they are big cells with a pycnotic nucleus that's the key thing they have a pycnotic nucleus what kind of cells do you see with progesterone with progesterone it is going to be intermediate cells the intermediate cells usually stain blue and they have a slightly bigger nucleus so blue and a bigger nucleus is what is progesterone. Remember, in the absence of estrogen and progesterone, it's going to be parabasal cells. But now coming back to the important thing, granulosa cell, how else can they ask you the same question? So if a lady has a granulosa cell tumor, can you tell me what other evaluation does she need? Okay, what other evaluation does this patient need? So please remember, they secrete estrogen which can definitely cause endometrial hyperplasia as well as endometrial cancer. So when we ask you what other evaluation is absolutely mandatory, it has to be endometrial biopsy or an endometrial sampling. These women must undergo endometrial sampling to rule out hyperplasia and cancer. Who is going to tell me? A drug which can again cause endometrial hyperplasia and cancer and is usually given to breast cancer patients but can in turn cause endometrial cancer? Yes, so similar question they would ask you with respect to tamoxifen. So please remember tamoxifen can also cause endometrial hyperplasia, it can also cause endometrial polyp, it can also cause endometrial cancer. Right, so if these women have abnormal bleeding, you must do an endometrial sampling. Yes, so these are important aspects. They twist and turn these questions and keep asking you again and again. Also, remember granulosa cells because they are estrogen producing, one of the presentations in younger girls can also be precocious puberty. Right, so in younger girls, granulosa cell tumors can also cause precocious puberty right everyone perfect okay can you tell me the classic histopath finding yes the classic histopath finding is call exner bodies and what you would see there are rosettes right so you would see rosettes and they are call exner bodies okay yes we will talk about tumor markers but yes someone already answered it in the chat box it is inhibin the tumor marker is inhibin Okay, perfect. Good going everyone. Ready for the next one? Okay, so a multiple completion type and a topic that the INICT are fond of asking. I'm going to give you two seconds to commit your answer. So, not true. Please be careful. Okay, not true about the type of pregnancy shown below. Okay, not true about the type of pregnancy shown below. I'm sure you can all make out this is the snowstorm appearance which is also called as honeycomb appearance right and once you know that you know that it is a complete mole okay so it is a complete mole not just a mole so now let's see if you could do it correct 
What about option number one? Is the karyotype 46XX? Yes, so this is an absolutely true statement. The most common karyotype is 46XX, right? 80 to 90 percent of times the karyotype is going to be 46XX. Remember, they are diploid, but they are monospermic. So, diploid hote hai, monospermic hote hai, 46XX hote hai, and the entire genetic material is derived from the male partner. The ovum is empty. Okay, there is no genetic material in the ovum. Right? Let's look at option number B. Is it true? No, it is incorrect. This is a false statement. There is not a focal hydropic change. Focal hydropic change is a marker of partial mole. What do you see in complete mole? You have to see a complete hydropic degeneration of the placenta and you also have to know that the placenta will definitely have villus villi formation is there but these villi are avascular so remember the histopathological findings please remember because they are avascular there is no fetus okay let's look at option number c has been a pyq in inict again is the treatment of choice suction evacuation? That is right. The treatment of choice is suction and evacuation. Can we do hysterectomy? Yes, we can. But hysterectomy will be done when it is a complete mole and the family is complete. And even more important, if the woman is beyond 40 years of age. So, hysterectomy can be done, but the treatment of choice is suction evacuation. What about option number 4? Is it true? Converts into choriocarcinoma in 20%? No, this is a false statement. What is the risk of conversion of complete mole into choriocarcinoma? This is 4%. The risk of complete mole converting into GTN, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, is what is 15 to 20 percent. Okay, partial mole, remember, for conversion into GTN is around 3 to 5 percent. And partial mole converting into choriocarcinoma is negligible, less than 1 percent. And yes, someone said it correctly in the chat box. The most common karyotype of partial mole is a triploidy 69XXY. And they are dispermic. So remember these important features. They are repeatedly asked in the INICT exam. And don't make common or easy mistakes. Please don't overthink in the exam. So since we had to mark the not true statements, the answer becomes 2 and 4 or D. So if you have done it correct, Please mark it, right? So, we had to mark not true statements. So, therefore, the answer becomes D, 2 and 4 are false statements. Are you ready for the next one? Perfect. Okay. So, regarding HPV vaccine, which statement is not true? So, commit your answer quickly in the chat box as well as in your answer sheets and then we would start the discussion. So, regarding HPV vaccine, not true. So, is it made from the L1 capsid protein? Yes. This is a true statement, right? Screening has to be continued after the vaccine. That is also a true statement, right? Is it contraindicated in pregnancy? That is also true. So, what is the answer? The answer is A. Ideal age for the vaccine is not 21 years or beyond. The ideal age is actually 11 to 12 years. That's the ideal age. It can be given as early as 9 and as late up to 26, but ideal is 11 to 12. Remember the dosing schedule, okay? Remember the dosing schedule. If the girl is less than 21 years of age, she can receive one or two doses, okay? Those are the SAGE guidelines, one of the recent PYQs, okay? Whereas, if she is more than or equal to beyond 21 years, then she will receive two doses. And what is the time gap between two doses? Six months, right? The time gap between two doses is six months. The dose is 0 0.5 ml. It is an intramuscular injection, okay? 
so please remember this yes it can be given as early as 9 okay and as late as 26 but the ideal age is around 11 to 12 years of age okay what other vaccines are contraindicated in pregnancy so please remember remember mmr remember varicella and remember hpv vaccine they are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy okay which viral proteins quickly tell me which viral proteins cause malignant transformation which ones are going to cause malignant transformation so e6 and e7 remember the basic pathophysiology e6 will knock out which tumor suppressor gene p53 and e7 will knock out the retinoblastoma gene so they are all examples of tumor suppressor genes and that is the pathophysiology sometimes inict asks the pathophysiology in detail so you have to know altered e2 okay altered e2 protein of the virus will up regulate okay it will up regulate e6 and e7 and then they lead to malignant transformation so inict does go into details of the topic that it is fond of asking so as i said not just remember e6 e7 remember e2 that altered e2 will up regulate e6 and e7 which will knock out the tumor suppressor genes okay perfect very well right the classic histopath finding is coilocytosis susmita you are right okay ready for the next one everyone okay and mark your answers in the chat box as well as in your own sheet of paper and then we will evaluate at the end how many correct do you get out of 20 so question number nine is your patient is rh negative her ict titer at 28 weeks is one is to four what is the next step in her evaluation management so what is the answer for this one let's see what you are going to commit in your answer sheets as well as in the chat box absolutely right so kashma and other no shambhavi the answer is not d so let's look at this the answer is c repeat ict after four weeks please remember ict only and only if it is negative that's when you give anti d you will not mark anti d to be given if ict is positive right so in this question anti d is out so this is out in fact option d is also out right so we give anti d only when ict is negative we don't give it if ict is positive in this particular patient the ict is positive and it is less than the critical value which is 1 is to 16 because it is less than the critical value what is the answer you have to follow up with repeat ict every four weeks in case the question you get in the exams the value is more than or equal to 1 is to 16 that's when you do mca doppler who is going to tell me what is the best use of mca doppler what is the best use so mca doppler ka best use hai to look for fetal anemia right so to look for fetal anemia and absolutely right dr drake value more than or equal to 1.5 mom indicates significant anemia okay it indicates significant anemia these days we are not doing amniocentesis for it okay now a, a little question that i want everyone to understand if the baby has already developed hydrops fetalis okay and you are doing chordocentesis can you tell me why would you do chordocentesis if there is hydrops we are going to do this to do intrauterine transfusions and now they will confuse you do, do you need to give anti d after doing this chordo yes or no so don't get confused if the baby is hydropic or if we are doing chordocentesis it already means the pregnancy is sensitized right which means there is no role of anti d after chordocentesis in this this case usually we say whenever we do invasive procedures give anti d but that is when the patient is not yet sensitized right 
perfect. So good going everyone. I'm happy that you're able to answer the questions and answer them with good concepts, not just mugging up. So very well done. Happy for all of you. Let's go on to the next one now. Okay, again an important topic and you usually get questions. So lady has come for emergency contraception on the fifth day of an unprotected intercourse, what will you recommend to her? What is going to be the answer? So quickly comment in the answer box and then we will discuss. What is the answer for this one? So are you going to give her LNG tab? Are you going to give her Ulipristal or are you going to give her copper tea? Yes, so perfect. The answer is going to be A copper tea. Why? Because this is the most effective emergency contraceptive, especially when you talk about the fifth day post intercourse, right? So, it is the most effective method. Ulipristal is also effective, but less effective than copper tea. It is actually most effective hormonal EC. Please remember the INICT exams are fond of asking the doses and the schedules. So, if it is Ulipristal, it is 30 milligrams single dose. It can be given up to 5 days, but the more effective one is copper tea. It also gives uh, continued contraception. Okay. What about LNG tab? So, remember there are two ways of taking LNG tab, and INICT has asked questions on both. It can be taken as a single dose of 1.5 milligrams, but ideal is within 72 hours. Okay, within 72 hours is what is ideal for LNG tab. It can also be taken as 0.75 milligrams, but then it has to be repeated after 12 hours. It has been a PYQ in INICT, so EC is important. Okay, you need to know the details. Now, if I ask you which is the most commonly used emergency contraceptive, the most commonly used emergency contraceptive is LNG tab. This is not same as POP. Okay, LNG tab is not same as POP. The dose is very, very different. Also, yes, a better method to take LNG tab is a single dose. So, single dose is a better way of taking it than dividing the dose. Also, who is going to tell me what category drug is ulipristal? Has been a PYQ again. What category drug is ulipristal? So, ulipristal is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. Okay. It is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. Okay. Also, what is the main mechanism of action of copper tea? What is the main mechanism of action? So, whenever we ask you main mechanism of action for copper tea, the single best answer is inhibition of fertilization. The second best answer is inhibition of ovulation. Okay. Please remember, mini pill, misoprostol are not emergency contraceptives. Okay. Misoprostol is an ab ab abortifacient. And in mini pill, the dose is very less. They are not prescribed as emergency contraceptives. Please don't do this mistakes. Ready? Ready for the next one, everybody? Okay, perfect. Let's go on to the next one. Again, a very, very important topic. We see repeated questions on it. Take your time. Take two seconds and match the vaginal discharge with their likely cause. Okay. So, take two seconds and then we begin the discussion. Meanwhile, you can start committing your answers in the answer sheet or in the chat box as well and we will see them later. We will discuss how many have you got later. Okay, everybody has to keep track on how many correct are you doing. It is going to be a confidence booster. Yes? Okay, let's look at the answer. So, please remember, it was confusing here. So, when you say bacterial vaginosis, you remember gray discharge, but do you also remember that it can be off-white? Yes. So, it can be off-white and foul smelling is the key thing. It has to be gray or off-white discharge, okay? And it has to be a copious discharge. It cannot be a scanty discharge in bacterial vaginosis. Remember, it has to be foul smelling. On the other hand, when you talk about candida, 
you know that it is white and i thought you might get confused but you didn't so i am very happy with that so candida has to be a thick discharge and it is scanty because it sticks to the vaginal walls and most importantly candida is not foul smelling discharge okay and the key thing in candidiasis has to be itching okay in bacterial vaginosis there is no itching there is no dyspareunia there is no dysuria right with candida itching or pruritus is the main complaint discharge is less important but it is not foul smelling right perfect are you ready for the next one okay trichomonas so trichomonas is easy you all remember green discharge but do you remember yellow so yes please remember it is yellow and it is again foul smelling it has to be foul smelling with trichomonas it is also or may be associated with itching dysuria dyspareunia okay so trichomonas <coughs> physiological discharge so please remember physiological discharge may be copious may be scanty it may be thick it may be thin but it should never be foul smelling okay and there should never be itching there should never be urinary symptoms so no urinary symptoms no pruritus why do i say the discharge can be thin or thick because it depends on the hormone if it's estrogen it is a thin discharge if it's progesterone it will be a thick discharge if it's scanty it's progesterone if it's copious it's estrogen so don't rely your answers on that rely your answers on other things now we are going to discuss just key important other aspects that they give as hints in the INICT exam so remember in physiological discharge the ph of vagina will be normal so it has to be less than 4.5 okay trichomonas the ph has to be more than 4.5 candida less than 4.5 and bacterial vaginosis more than 4.5 important they have been pyqs with bacterial vaginosis it is gardnerella vaginalis and your hint is clue cell often i tell my students if it is difficult for you to remember or look at clue cell please understand use the hints in the mcq if it's only an image based question look at the borders if the borders are hazy then it is probably a clue cell because it is studded with bacteria okay remember trichomonas is a pure shaped organism and you can actually see the flagella so if you do a saline microscopy you will see the flagella if you are seeing clear borders of the cells then it will not be clue cells it's likely to be trichomonas so use other hints in the clinical vignette okay and uh, i think candida we have already talked about the key things about candida okay with trichomonas they also tell you about strawberry cervix so it's important and for bacterial vaginosis you have to know about the wif test okay done with 10% koh okay so what is the correct answer then a3 that's right what about candida b1 c is going to be 2 and d is going to be 4 that makes the answer as d so i am sure most of you have got it right and i'm very very happy and you're doing well that's right viraj patel amsel's criteria are for bacterial vaginosis okay please know the kits as well for vaginal discharge it is kit 2 green yes for cervicitis or cervical discharge it is going to be kit 1 or gray and for pelvic inflammatory disease or lower abdominal pain it is going to be kit 6 and yellow those are the other things that they ask around the topic ready for the next one everyone yes kk metronidazole is safe in pregnancy it remains as the drug of choice for bacterial vaginosis in pregnancy the other drug of choice can be clindamycin in pregnancy okay chalo the next question is which of the following are included in making a diagnosis of severe preeclampsia so all of you are going to commit your answer and then i'm going to start discussing yes so let's look at this is option number a correct 
no this is an incorrect statement to say it is severe preeclampsia it has to be more than or equal to 160 by 110 a common error please remember it can be only systolic which is high it can be only diastolic which is high we don't need both even if one of this is high it is included in the criteria it is included what about iugr is it included no iugr oliguria okay they are not included as criteria for preeclampsia with severe features what about option number three serum creatinine more than 1.1 yes that is included because it indicates end organ damage headache and scotomas yes because they indicate cerebral damage okay so, visual symptoms, cerebral symptoms, they are included in preeclampsia with severe features. Apart from that, pulmonary edema, okay, platelet count less than 1 lakh, liver enzymes more than twice the normal value, okay. So, these are also included as criteria for preeclampsia with severe features. So, that makes the answer as C and most of you have got it correct. I am very, very happy. Remember one more important thing. They often give you about question on IE, impending eclampsia. If they ask you next step and you have to mark one answer, then it is going to be injection MagSulf. If you are going to answer it in the form of multiple completion type, then it should be MagSelf plus antihypertensive, which is labetalol, plus it has to be termination of pregnancy once you stabilize the patient. So be careful. If it is multiple completion, you should include all of these in the management. Okay, then include all of these in the management. Okay, are you ready for the next one? Yes. Are you ready? Just give me a minute. I'm going to bring back the screen in a moment. Okay. All right. Till then, I hope you're doing well and we are going to go on to the next question. So quickly ready and commit your answers in this one. Which of the following characterizes a normal simon sample? So, please remember very often they repeat question as well. So, unless they have mentioned as per the new WHO guidelines, you can stick to the older values. Most of the time, the AIMS people are going to write as per WHO, as per SAGE, as per the latest values. So, most of the times they'll tell you what you need to answer it accordingly. If nothing is mentioned, you can very well stick to the older values because it is extremely likely they have just repeated the question as it is and that's what they do, right? So, let's answer this question now. Sperm concentration of 15 million per ml, is it correct? Yes, this is a true statement. What is the value based on the newer guidelines? The newer guidelines are 16 million per ml. So, almost same, okay? 5% normal morphology. Is it a true statement? Yes, because the minimum requirement is 4%. So, anything more than or equal to 4% is normal. Okay, 10% progressive motility is wrong. The original was 32%. What is the new one? The new value is... 30 percent volume of 1.5 ml this is a true statement what is the newer value the newer value is 1.4 ml right so as of now we are going to include 1 2 and 4 and that makes the answer as d and i can see that all of you have answered it correctly so very well done quickly give me these other important points about simon analysis number one question number one can you tell me which is the single best parameter for conception or natural conception so please remember single best parameter for natural conception is morphology okay that is going to be morphology what term are you going to use if motility is less? What term are you going to use if motility is less? So, terato, sorry, then asthenospermia. So, reduced motility is what you see with Carthaginer's syndrome. 
okay, with Carthaginous syndrome and that is what is asthenospermia, has been a PYQ, okay, so Carthaginous is asthenospermia. Tell me the next question, single best parameter to differentiate obstructive from non-obstructive azoospermia, what is the answer? So, the best answer to differentiate obstructive from non-obstructive is going to be FSH levels. Again, a PYQ. So, I have covered a lot of PYQs in this session. Although the questions are going to be 20, but we have covered a lot of MCQs including PYQs in today's session. Perfect. You are all giving me correct answers which is true. So, remember if the patient has Kleinfelter, she, uh, he has non-obstructive azoospermia, okay, whereas if the man has cystic fibrosis, okay, then that is obstructive azoospermia, okay, so then that will be obstructive azoospermia. Are you ready for the next one? Okay, I am thoroughly enjoying this session, it is like a rapid fire round. So, let us see if you can do the next one, which is not a non-contraceptive benefit of OCP which is not. So, be careful to use or identify these keywords, not a non-contraceptive benefit. So, is hirsutism a benefit? Yes. OCPs are definitely the drug of choice for hirsutism, has been a PYQ by itself. Okay, so drug of choice is PYQ, uh, for hirsutism is OCP. Okay, does it decrease the risk of cervical cancer? No. In fact, OCPs can increase the risk of cervical cancer if used for a longer duration of time. Do they reduce the risk of endometrial cancer? Yes, they do. In fact, they also reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. Okay. What about colon cancer? Colon cancer, again, they reduce the risk. Okay. What about hepatic adenoma? increase hepatic adenoma they increase the risk okay do they cause reduction in benign breast disease yes that is true they decrease benign breast disease but yes they can slightly when used continuously they can increase the risk of breast cancer slightly please remember to learn the absolute contraindications for ocps as well as intrauterine devices, they are important for your exams. Some of the students get confused between OCPs and postmenopausal HRT and they do the MCQ wrong. Please don't do that. Okay, so if we talk about postmenopausal HRT, it increases risk of breast cancer. Okay, please remember only E type can increase risk of endometrial cancer, okay. E plus P is what increases the risk of breast cancer. Only E increases the risk of endometrial cancer. Any type of postmenopausal HRT, whether it is only E or E plus P, they increase risk of venous thromboembolism, both types, E alone as well as E plus P, they increase the risk of venous thromboembolism. Okay, that is why conditions like stroke, coronary artery disease, previous venous thromboembolism, they are going to be contraindications. All right, so don't do these things wrong. They are important. Don't get confused between the two. Okay, perfect. Ready for the next one? Okay, again, something that the AIMS people are fond of asking. So, which ovarian tumor is not correctly matched with the histopathological finding? So, quickly commit your answers and then. I will start discussing. So, what are the answers? So, let us look at this. Brenner's tumor. Do you see transitional epithelium? That is absolutely right. And what is the uh, histopathological finding called as? It is called as Waldard cell nest. Okay. Waldard cell nest. All right. Yes. Samir Absolutely, yes. OCPs also increase the risk of venous thromboembolism. That is why VTE, stroke or CAD, they are contraindications of any type of estrogen. Okay. Then moving on to the next one. Dysgerminoma, do you see nest of large oval or round cells separated by fibrous septic containing lymphocytes? Yes, you have to know this. Okay. 
and what is the gross appearance it is very characteristic again in dysdermenoma it is lobular or lobulated it is tan or pink in color and it is a solid tumor what is the tumor marker for dysdermenoma ldh the single best answer is ldh okay remember for dysdermenoma it does not produce alpha fetoprotein okay chalo endodermal sinus tumor shilla duval bodies is true they look like glomerulus right so this is also called as the yolk sac tumor so they look like glomerulus and the main tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein remember it does not secrete hcg is that clear to everyone perfect why is option a wrong so that's the answer here because choriocarcinoma will have dimorphic cells okay you will see dimorphic cells it has to be cyto and syncytiotrophoblast so you will see both types of cells mononuclear cells as well as multinuclear cells right perfect good going everyone are you ready for the next one okay chalo which teratogen is not correctly paired okay which teratogen is not correctly paired again please go and see what i have taught you about teratogens it is important for inict exam in fact please go and see the pyt previous year topic discussions in e medicos they are absolutely most high yielding and very very productive crisp concise you can revise it multiple times as well okay so let's tell me this what is not correctly paired so is a correctly paired yes so with sle it is going to be complete heart block what do you see or with which drug do you see epstein's anomaly i'm going to cover the other important ones as well so epstein's anomaly is going to be seen with yes lithium okay perfect zika virus do we see microcephaly yes that's also a true statement of pyq as well what are the key other things they want to give you hof bohr cells right so the transmission is through hof bohr cells which are fetal macrophages also when you talk what is the agent for transmission mosquito right okay does hiv cause neural tube defects no please remember hiv does not cause anomalies okay no anomaly is seen what is the concern with hiv transmission of the virus itself right so it is basically transmission of the virus which is seen with hiv but it does not cause anomalies remember varicella it causes skin scarring and limb defects who is going to tell me when is the risk of congenital varicella syndrome highest when is the risk of congenital varicella syndrome highest so highest risk has been a pyq when it is seen between 13 to 20 weeks okay so when the mother gets infected between 13 to 20 weeks what about neonatal varicella neonatal varicella is different this is seen when the mother gets infected 5 days before to 2 days after delivery okay to 2 days after delivery that's what is neonatal varicella don't get confused quickly tell me which teratogen okay can cause hydrops fetalis or which virus so when we talk about hydrops fetalis please remember parvo virus b19 and syphilis remember they are causes of non immune hydrops right so remember they are causes of non immune hydrops okay please remember drugs like valproate are not to be given okay so it is going to cause neural tube defects so valproate is absolutely contraindicated methotrexate or mycophenolate mofetil okay these are again absolutely contraindicated ace inhibitors these are all pyqs they are absolutely contraindicated so remember and don't overthink in these questions they should come to you as a reflex okay so they should come to you as a reflex fetal alcohol syndrome is one more thing which inict asks so remember the triad of fas who is going to tell me the triad of fas the triad of fas is characteristic facial features 
growth restriction and microcephaly. Okay. So, facial features, growth restriction and microcephaly. So, remember fast as well. Should we move on to the next one? Is everyone ready? Okay, perfect. Again, a very important topic that the AIMS people are fond of asking. They will ask something or the other. So, go through my PYT sessions as well. Not true about PPH. So, let's quickly do this. Is the maximum dose of carboprost 2 milligrams? Yes. 2 milligrams is true statement. What is the dose? The dose is 0.25 milligrams. Okay, 0.25 milligrams intramuscular and you would you can give it 8 times. So, that is the correct statement. Placenta accreta spectrum is a risk factor. Absolutely true. PAS is a risk factor. And Remember, placenta previa and previous cesarean are risk factors for pass in turn. Okay. Routine uterine massage is done for prevention of PPH. This is false and this is the answer. Routine massage is not recommended in AMT SL. Massage will be done. In fact, it's only feeling for the tone of the uterus intermittently, which is a component of AMT SL. Okay, massage is routinely done for treatment of PPH. So, remember this and don't do it wrong. B lynch is done when medical management fails. Yes. So, when medical or conservative management fails, then we move on to B lynch, which are uterine compression sutures. But please remember, these compression sutures are usually done when the vitals are stable. If your patient has failed medical management and vitals are unstable, what are you going to do then? If vitals are unstable, then you have to proceed to systematic pelvic devascularization. Okay, where you begin with ligation of uterine arteries. Then you progress to ligation of ovarian artery and then you progress to ligation of internal iliac that to anterior division it has to be only the anterior division please go back and read the risk factors of pph okay types of pph they are important for your exam so primary remember it is within 24 hours and it's uterine atony okay and secondary is beyond 24 hours up to 12 weeks and it is usually because of retained small placental tissue Right? Ready for the next one, everyone? Okay. And also go and revise AMTSL. It's very, very important. Right. So, not true about clomiphene citrate. You have to mark not true. I'm going to give you two seconds and then I start discussion. Yes? So, not true. Does it cause endometrial thinning? Yes. Because it is, although a SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator, but the main action is antag on endometrium. So, on the endometrium, it works as an antag and it causes endometrial thinning. Causes monofollicular development. That is the answer. It causes multifollicular development. What causes monofollicular? Monofollicular ka answer hai letrozole. Right? So, please remember, letrozole causes monofollicular development. In fact, that is one of the reasons why we prefer it as the drug of choice for PCOS as compared to clomiphene, right? So, it causes monofollicular. Does it inhibit negative feedback on Gian Naraj? Yes, it is acting as an antag primarily, so it inhibits the negative feedback, okay? Can it be used with gonadotropins? Yes. So, sometimes, uh, you know, if a woman is poor responder, you can combine the true drugs. You can combine gonadotropins with letrozole or gonadotropins with CC. Not commonly done, but done in poor responders. So, what is the crux of the story? The crux of the story is go with the option which feels obviously wrong. Please learn this art. When you are confused between two options, don't start overthinking. Go with the option which seems obviously wrong. And for the other option, you have to think a lot then that usually will not be the answer. So, go with the one which is coming to you as an obviously wrong statement, right? Please remember, letrozole is what category drug? Aromatase inhibitor. 
yes so it is a uh, aromatase inhibitor and remember its t half was recently asked as a pyq and it is 48 hours whereas for clomiphene citrate it's actually 2 weeks okay so it's 2 weeks remember the live birth rate is also higher with letrozole okay so live birth rate is also higher with letrozole and that's why i said it becomes the drug of choice for pcos that brings us to the second last question for the day. Are you all ready? Yes, ready for the second last? Okay, shallow. Again, something that the AIMS people are characteristically asking, that is arrange in sequence questions. Neat PG doesn't ask this pattern usually, but AIMS does. So arrange in the correct sequence of these tests. I'm going to give you two seconds to arrange them and come at your answer and then I start discussing. Okay, shallow. So let's see. So if we look at growth scan, when is it done? So growth scan is done in the third trimester, typically between 28 to 32 weeks. Okay, that's when you do the growth scan. What about NT scan? NT scan has to be done between 11 to 13 weeks. What about anomaly scan? Anywhere between 18 to 22 weeks. What about gestational age assessment? First trimester. Or may be best answer is 7 to 9 weeks. Which means what comes first? 4. Right? So gestational age assessment comes first. Then comes NT scan which is 2. And there is only one option with that. So the answer is 4, 2, 3, 1. When you are answering these questions, be careful. Take a moment, okay? I have made the options not very confusing, but they can. So usually, if you do two correct, don't spend additional time. Most of the times, you'll be able to mark it if you've got the two correct, okay? But in the other two, as I said, always go with the things which you feel obviously wrong instead of overthinking, okay? Perfect. Okay, yes. Gestational age is same as a dating scan, okay, which is uh, done in the first trimester. Fetal echo is something that the AIMS people ask. So, fetal echo is again between 18 to 20 weeks, not done for everyone, only for high risk. Whereas, anomaly scan is done for everyone, okay. So, anomaly scan is done for everyone, yes. Ready, everybody? Are you ready for the last question of the day? And then you can tell me your score. Shallow. Your patient has a pap smear report of carcinoma in C2. What is the next step? Who is going to tell me what is the answer? And that is the last question for the day. And then you are going to tell me your scores. Right? So, remember very basic things. Sometimes AIMS people are actually asking more basics than need PG. They want you to know the basics and the application and the depth in some of the topics. Right, so please remember whenever pap smear is abnormal, you have to do a confirmation and that is going to be by colposcopic directed biopsy, okay. So please remember there is no point of doing HPV DNA, most of them are going to be positive. Hysterectomy is usually not done for pre-invasive lesions and carcinoma in C2 is a pre-invasive lesion. Conization is typically reserved when we want to look for micro-invasion. Yes? So, if you want to look for micro-invasion or if there is suspicion of adenocarcinoma, that's when you do a conization. Right? So, colpo biopsy is the best answer here. Remember, if a patient comes with post-coital bleeding and they ask you, what do you do next? Okay, the answer has to be a purse speculum examination and a pap smear. Okay, if they say the patient has postcoital bleeding and a visibly abnormal cervix, the abnormality could be anything, thickened cervix, ulcerated cervix. If there is a visibly abnormal cervix, then it has to be a biopsy. It can be a punch biopsy, it can be a four quadrant biopsy, but it has to be a biopsy if it is visibly abnormal. Okay? So, remember these things. Also, remember about the green filter. 
okay remember about the green filter in the colposcope which is used to look for vessels remember about the fixative of pap smear right 95 percent ethyl alcohol please remember no air drying right so those are some of the other important pyqs that have been asked okay so perfect and that comes to the end of uh, our predictor series for obzingaini i just hope it turns out to be useful for all of you not only for revision but also for your real exam also please ensure do the pyts i assure you they will be super high yielding pyts and they are nothing new nothing extra but core topics which inict is fond of asking right and now you can let me know your scores so how many of you have got 20 out of 20 anybody who's got all 20 correct anyone okay anyone who's got 18 19 or 20 how many of you have got 18 19 and 20 i think if that's your score it's excellent obsin gyni is a very high yielding topic in inict you get quite a number of questions so you know if you are anywhere around 18 19 20 excellent okay then 15 16 17 wow shobhit and parul have got 20 out of 20 excellent so chocolates from my side good wishes from my side 15 16 17 how many okay so many 19 sumit singh binder excellent very well done so i think you all have done very very well i hope excellent adith 20 out of 20 sirosi 19 superb okay i don't know how someone got 25 because i just start 20 questions maybe you were noting down the other things that i asked you but very well done so back up guys even if you are anywhere around 10 or above that you know please understand you just need to give the final push okay you need to give the final push anybody who is less than 10 i would say sab kuch chhod ke pyt revise kar lo just open the pyt session revise that you will see your score will boost up okay so with that i'm going to wish good luck to all of you yes i do have a telegram channel you can search by my name obzin gaini with dr deepthi behel right so that is the telegram channel i'll put the link of the telegram channel in the chat box and i will pin it if you have any other doubts where i can help you do let me know and as dr sumer always says apna time apun khud laega so all the best you're all very very capable and you will definitely shine and make us all proud lots of love lots of good wishes back up